Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a look at implementing principles to actions. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI Technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. Tonight, I'm really excited to be joined by our two panelists, Gail Burrell and Pam Harris. Gail was a secondary math teacher and department chair in suburban Milwaukee for over 28 years. She is currently a math specialist in the program for math education at Michigan State University. She served as president of the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics and as director of the Mathematical Sciences Education Board. Her research interests are statistics education, the use of technology in teaching secondary mathematics, and issues related to what it means to teach mathematics. Gail, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. And Pam teaches at Texas State University and facilitates professional learning for teachers K through 12. She's authored several books, including Building Numeracy and Discovering Advanced Algebra. She's been a T-Cube instructor since her days of teaching high school, and she believes in both the power of mental math and using technology as a tool for learning. Pam, thanks, thanks for joining us tonight. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send questions to Gail or Pam using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded, and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting Communicate from the very top of the WebEx menu and choose Audio Broadcast. At this point, Pam is going to discuss our agenda. So tonight we're going to talk about the effective teaching practices. And to do that, we're going to use a couple of our favorite tasks or four of our favorite tasks to exemplify those. And at the very end tonight, there will be a free online resource drawing. And the drawing tonight will be one lucky winner to receive a free registration for T-Cubes International Conference, which is a really great conference. So hang around uh, until the end to be part of that drawing. Thanks so much, Pam. And Gail is going to discuss our expected outcomes. So tonight we're really focusing on making the principles to actions come alive in your classroom. And we're, the tasks that we've chosen um, are hopefully will help us think about how we can make some of those um, actions that um, really take place in our own classrooms. Um, and obviously we're going to be using um, dynamic interactive technology to make sure that that happens. Um, and then we might think a little bit about the nature of the tasks that we're using um, so that how they engage kids in the standards for mathematical practice, um, as well as engaging us in the uh, effective teaching practices. So stay in touch with social media and upcoming events by um, working through with us um, tonight. Gail, thanks so much. Pam, let me give you control. Feel free to share your screen. Great. And Mike, you're going to remind me how I share my screen. No, I found it. Ah, I'm so technologically adept tonight. It's unreal. Okay, fabulous. Let me get this going. So tonight we're going to be talking about the principles to actions, uh, the standards that are in the principles to actions book. Principles to actions was written by NCTM. Uh, you just heard that Gail was a past president of NCTM. It's actually when I met Gail, I was a young teacher, and uh, I went to my first NCTM regional conference, and Gail was um, a randomly chosen session that I went to, and she's phenomenal. And I, well, I remember in the middle of the session thinking to myself, she's really good, and then later I found out that she was the president of NCTM, and so obviously other people thought she was good as well. Um, so NCTM published in 2014 this Principles to Actions book, and in it, it, they created standards for teachers or teaching standards. And so we'd like to talk about those tonight. Um, they're called the Effective Teaching Practices. 
And these are the eight effective teaching practices for um, as standards for teachers. And rather than read them all out loud to you on this sort of busy slide, I'm going to show you a graphic that was created uh, that sort of puts them in a framework. And so these are those same eight practices, but they're kind of in a framework. So if you'll notice at the top, we can kind of think of one of these standards for teaching that before we begin, we need to establish mathematics goals to focus learning. It makes sense. We need to have goals where they can help focus our learning. And then once we have those mathematics goals to focus the learning, then we kind of go two directions. One, we need to implement tasks that promote reasoning and problem solving. So we're going to choose good tasks and we're going to be mindful that those tasks actually promote reasoning and problem solving. And at the same time, working together, we want those tasks to help build procedural fluency from conceptual understanding. So we really want students understanding what's happening, and we also want them to be able to do stuff. We don't want to just have kids have some vague notions, but we also want them to be able to solve problems and have some facility with solving problems. We don't want them stymied uh, when they look at something. We want them to be able to ask themselves, what do I know and what can I do from here? So those two work together as we implement tasks. I think students are, are building procedural fluency from conceptual understanding. Now, to do both of those things, we're going to do the bottom rectangle. And the bottom rectangle con contains the rest of the standards for teaching. So as we do the tasks and we're building that conceptual understanding or procedural fluency from conceptual understanding, we can facilitate meaningful mathematical discourse. So the kids are doing the task, they're working on building that fluency and conceptual understanding, and we help that as teachers by facilitating meaningful discourse around the mathematics that they're working on. How do we facilitate meaningful mathematical discourse? Well, we do it through these other four teaching standards. We might pose purposeful questions. Of course, purposeful questions will support that meaningful discourse. We might use and connect mathematical representations. Um, it's one of the, the biggest parts of my work in building powerful numeracy is to actually help teachers um, think about how to make thinking visible. How can we represent uh, the thinking and reasoning that's happening so that students can use those representations and they can connect the meaning between those representations. Um, it's, it, uh, sometimes people um, actually will raise their eyebrow a little bit about the fact that I'm an author of Building Powerful Numeracy, but I'm also a technology expert and advocate the use of technology. Um, and I think that those work really well hand in hand, that those are not in in conflict at all because uh, we can actually use technology to help build that thinking and reasoning. And one of the ways is that I think technology can help us use and connect those representations. What else is happening? We're also um, eliciting and using student thinking. We want to really pull that evidence out of students. Notice how connected that is to how that, that we're going to represent that thinking. And we got that thinking. We elicited it by posing those purposeful questions. And then lastly, as students are solving problems, we want to support that struggle but it needs to be productive, but we want to support that productive struggle as they're learning the mathematics. And then, of course, uh, when we sort of get to the end of that cycle, then we need to go back to the beginning and continue to establish goals to focus the rest of the learning, so the continued learning as, as we go. So I kind of like the way this framework is set up because it kind of uh, helps put these eight teaching practices in such a way that we kind of understand how they work together and support each other um, for better teaching. Gail, do you want to pipe in with anything on this slide? Oh, no, I think you're doing actually great. <laughs> Gail, but I guess I would say one thing. Um, the, for a long time, all of us is, who've been teaching in our classrooms have been doing what we thought was the really best thing we could for our kids. And it's kind of exciting to know that there's some research that's emerging that supports that these are some of the things that really are the best things we can do. Um, and so to know that we're beginning to collect research that, that helps us think about the right ways to approach the teaching in our classrooms is kind of exciting. I would agree with that. And I think it's been really helpful for me to um, implement, especially some of the research around um, listening carefully to students. So when I look at the bottom left standard about eliciting and using evidence of student thinking, to me that was something I never as a beginning teacher, uh, or certainly as a student, that was never obvious to me that that was a thing that teachers were trying to do. And so I don't know about the rest of you, but it's been um, quite a challenge for me to think about student thinking and um, being able to plan for possible student responses and then how I would, uh, in that um, middle right 
uh, use and connect representations? How can I represent student thinking? So those are two areas that I'm really working hard uh, as, a, as a teacher myself to improve my practice. And then when I work with teachers in professional learning, one of the things I, I feel like I'm working with teachers on is the idea of uh, supporting productive struggle in learning math. I think um, if I can just share a quick experience that we had just recently, we talked with teachers about what it could look like to support productive struggle. We did some tasks with teachers, and then we went and did some videoing. And so I'll just maybe give you a non-example that we sort of found. We had a, a very um, well-meaning teacher with all the great intent went in, um, had a task that promoted reasoning and problem solving, and then um, needed to do a little work maybe on the posing purposeful questions. But uh, this particular teacher's idea of supporting struggle looked a little bit like um, uh, cheer, cheerleading and a little bit less like um, scaffolding or, or posing purposeful questions. So we, we heard a lot of, you can do it. Nope, keep trying. I believe in you. And, and none of those are bad messages, but they might not be enough. Uh, we might need to work a little bit more on um, the kinds of questions that we could pose that could help support students' um, struggle. So I'll talk to you more about, much more about those. What we'd like to do now is um, illustrate these eight teaching practices by doing a few of our favorite tasks and as we do those, uh, those tasks, we'll sort of ask you to consider what kinds of, uh, which, which of these practices maybe are being elicited uh, specifically by a specific task. So, so Pam, let me interrupt a minute. Sure. Uh, someone asked if these are set up like the essential learnings in the math classroom. And I'm not really familiar with essential learnings, but I'm thinking that the essential learnings are more what students are doing. And we'll come back at the end and talk about that. These are the things that we as teachers should be thinking about, the things that we should be doing to engage students in, in their learning. Um, so it's a slightly different focus, and we'll talk about that at the end. Yeah, that was well said. So if I were to ask you to consider what uh, square root means, or if I were to ask students to consider what square root means, so um, I've done a task with students where I literally ask them to think about square root. We have a brief conversation. Uh, most of the students, by the time I get them in high school, have heard of square root. They have some sense of square root. I might ask them, what's the square root of 9? What's the square root of 16? What's the square root of 4? And then uh, once we've established this idea that it's a number times itself gets the result, um, we're looking for that number multiplied by itself uh, would be 7, then I might ask students, um, what, what would be an estimate for you for the square root of 7? Now, uh, the initial rules of the game need to be a little bit that we're not going to use technology at the beginning. So no hitting the square root key or anything. We just want to do a little bit of estimating. So if I were to ask you to estimate the square root of 7, could you um, put in the chat what you are thinking about as an estimate? So please don't use the square root key. Don't use technology in that way. But if you could just estimate the square root of 7. And then Mike, don't think too poorly of me, but I'm having a hard time seeing my chat screen. Pam, I would never think poorly of you. Um, it's okay. Uh, I have my chat window up, and so I'll uh, I'll just start reading off some of the answers. I see like 2.75, 2.7, 2.6. Uh, someone said between two and three. Uh, another 2.7, 2.6, 2.6. Uh, I'd estimate it's about 2.65 between two and three. So I think we're getting a lot of those kind of similar similar responses. So that, now we're getting we're getting now to the hundredth. Ooh, so so I wonder. I'm curious how you're estimating quite to that level. Um, before maybe we do too many more um, estimates. Oh, I really like what Patrick had to say. Uh, I I found the chat window um, that it's got to be closer to three, and that's actually a question that I would ask students. Do you think it's closer to two or closer to three? And Patrick says it has to be closer to two since two squared is four, and three squared is nine, and and seven is closer to nine then we think um, it's going to have to be closer to three. So I heard a lot of 2.6s and 2.7s. What I do with students at this point is we get on a display um, graphing calculator, display handheld, and we literally type in one of their guesses. So we type in something like 2.6, and then we square it. Now, I might do 2.6 times 2.6. kind of depends on the kids. Um, so 2.6 squared, and then we just see what we get. Well, so, hmm, it's not quite 7. Well, then we better get a little higher. So somebody said 2.7. So we could literally type in 2.7, and we could try that. That's a little higher. We should, all right, maybe that's, that's going to, oh, oh, well, okay, that's close, but now that's too big. <laughs> now, one of my favorite questions is to ask students, well, what's in between 2.6 and 2.7? And 
sometimes we get kind of some stares back and, and they think a little bit. And I think somebody earlier had said 2.65, so we could try that. We could square 2.65. And after up, it's a little high. Okay, so what could be uh, another choice? And I could be watching the chat to see if anybody's throwing in something. If 2.65 is a little high and 2.6 was a little low, what would be maybe some more um, estimates that you guys have now that I know where I can see your chat window? Anybody have a, a different estimate for us? Well, Kim Faircloth, what in the world? Are you messing around with? <laughs> At this point, um, often students will start um, randomly guessing. And so I will ask students to pause a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and do 2.64 squared. But um, at some point, we'll ask students to pause and talk about how they're thinking. What, how, how, how are they coming up with the numbers they're coming up with? Because I definitely have seen students that just are randomly guessing. And, and even to the point where they're not even noticing that their guesses are, are still too high. And they, you know, they're not even zeroing in on the number. And the, the further out students go, um, we do get some pretty interesting, oh, I didn't want to go quite that big. Oh, well, I'm going to go quite that big one more time. Um, we get some pretty interesting uh, estimates um, where students uh, then then look at you with a look, and this is one of my favorite moments, where the, you can just see the look in their eye. Can we now do the same thing on our handhelds? And so then I set them free. Then I let students just go, now set them free. The, the square root key is broken, or don't use the square root key. But I let them just start to experiment. Um, and then as they start to experiment, then uh, when they come back, then I might choose, uh, we have somebody that just said 2.645, so we might try that one. And uh, once, uh, so I can set you guys loose now on um, your technology that you have. But again, all you can use is the square key, not the square root key. And as you go, you could get closer and closer, and we could get numbers that go, that, that we could get really close uh, to the approxima approximation of the square root of 7. There's a couple outcomes to this task that I'm looking for. A, I'm definitely looking for students to get better, a better sense of what square root means. I think there's um, a nice outcome that we get some really numeracy going. The students start to build their numeracy just by asking themselves what's in between 2.6 and 2.7 or what's in between 2.64 and 2.65. Um, and just, just the idea of having students start to mess with numbers that maybe they really haven't messed with in that way before. Uh, well, we're also building this idea of what does square root mean. Then I might ask students, uh, depending on uh, the grade level or the math outcome that I want, well, then what's a cube root? What does it mean when we um, do something cubed or cube root? Like, what if I were to ask you, let me just switch really fast here. I think on our PowerPoint, we asked you to estimate the cube root of 10. So again, if the cube root key, or you can't raise to the one third power, um, is broken on your calculator, you're, we're sort of putting that off limits. Could you in the chat, could you give me an estimate of what you think the cube root of 10 might be? Everybody just throw in that chat window what you think the cube root of 10 might be close to. I'm seeing some numbers like 2.1, 2.3, 2.2. So now I'll ask you to consider what could we do with technology to give, uh, I like Rebecca's uh, justification there that it's going to be between two and three, but closer to two. I wonder if you're thinking sort of similarly to how Patrick did before about thinking about two cubed and three cubed. So if we're thinking about the cube root of 10, what could we do with technology to work on that sense? Well, could we do something like you guys were thinking it might be 2.2, so I might do 2.2. Uh, there's a couple different ways I do this. It depends on, on the mood that I'm in. So I might do 2.2 times 2.2 times 2.2. I, I don't do this one too too much. Um, pretty quick, I'll go to the cube key. Um, but uh, we'll notice that it's a little too high. So two, uh, those of you that were 2.3, a little uh, way too high, right? So then I might be thinking about, well, then what might be 2.1? And we'll just go ahead and cube that. So 2.1 cubed, well, let's see what that does. Well, now we're a little bit too low. Okay, well, what's in between 2.1 and 2.2? And we could run sort of the same kind of thing back and forth and forth and back to get students thinking um, uh, both about what it means to have a cube root and also uh, just getting better about their sense of numeracy and being able to um, estimate cube uh, roots. And let me throw something in here. Yeah, the please. Thing that this is really good for is 
it's, it's pretty um, well known that kids have a lot of trouble with place value in decimals. Mm -hmm. This is really pushing at that and developing their understanding. Uh, as you said, numbers that are between 2.2 and 2.1 and, and how big they are. Just because you have a big string of bigger decimals, it doesn't mean it's a bigger number. Absolutely. And, and I actually remember doing this task with a group of Algebra 1 students um, one day when I had some kids starting to use uh, language that smacked very much of limits in calculus. And I remember uh, thinking as a teacher, a young teacher, I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, that's what a limit is. Like it, 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 in a huge way, the bigger that decimal got, bigger, quote unquote, literally meaning we were just adding digits at the end of the decimal point. Um, we were getting closer and closer to, say, the cube root of, t of 10, but, um, but we weren't, the number wasn't uh, changing. It wasn't that, or I, I, now, my, now I'm not uh, going to have very good words for that. Gail's a better calculus teacher than me. Maybe she has a better way to say that. Um, but it was, a, it was a moment for me where I gained some insight on the idea of a limit. Uh, just as, as an Algebra 1 teacher. Um, okay, so w we basically just did a really quick task where we estimated the square root of 7 and estimated the cube root of 10. I had some mathematical goals I was working on. If I were to ask you to consider the eight uh, teaching practices, w uh, maybe, uh, and Gail, I wish we'd thrown those back up here, so I'm actually going to back up to them. What, what uh, teaching practice do you think w I might have been trying to exemplify as uh, we just sort of did this task with estimating square roots. And maybe if you have some ideas of which one you think it, this task exemplifies, again, a teaching practice, something that I did as the teacher um, in these tasks, uh, maybe you could throw that in the chat window and we'll see what you guys are coming up with. I'm going to let a few go before we talk about them. And if you guys think it, it's more than one of them, feel free. So the first three, first, first four, ah, okay, so we, we've got, we've got a, a lot of different ideas about what this uh, particular task might exemplify. Um, Jennifer listed three different ones. Yeah, in a big way, I'm, I'm going to, suggest that maybe we did hit uh, a lot of them. Uh, the one that I specifically wanted to all, says Jennifer Nice, uh, the one that I specifically wanted to um, talk about was uh, using and connecting mathematical representations. And I don't think that's the only one. I think we definitely could have uh, supported productive struggle as kids could have. In fact, I'll, I'll mention, I think this is a, that often technology and using the power of technology uh, has a low cost of error. And the fact that it has a low cost of error the student can type in 2.5 squared and then go, oh, that's obviously too much or too little, depending on the question, and, um, and then just change it. And uh, there's, there's, no, there's no harm, no foul. Like there's nothing, there's no um, cost for that error. So students can just quickly try lots of different things and get um, responses. But the reason that I had using Connect Mathematical Representations would be that if I took this task and I did some things with um, maybe the notation of taking two times 2 times 2 or 2 cubed, and we probably don't want to have 2 times 2 times 2 cubed. I uh, put parentheses well, around. I, I fixed it. And <laughs> it That's funny. Gail fixed it, and I was like, yeah, it looks great, and neither of us caught that. So ignore that typo, everybody. Um, but, but if we have 2 times 2, or if the factor appears 3 times, then we can talk about the cube root of 8 being that 2. Um, and then we could connect that representation to 8 raised to the third power being 2. Um, and we can sort of connect that by seeing that those, uh, the factor repeated three times. Um, so connecting that representation could be a thing that I could uh, use this task to build with my students. And I, I really talk about this with my students as um, thinking about the, the third root, the cube root, is asking for a third of the factors. So if you have three twos, and you were looking for the cube root, you're asking for one third of those three twos, which is one two. Um, and that thinking, I mean, it, it's like if you have eight to the two thirds, you would be looking for two thirds of the factors. So it's a really nice way to help kids get into thinking about rational exponents. Very cool. All right, so uh, we're going to 
uh, switch gears just a little bit, and uh, this time we're going to start with one of the principles to action standards, and then Gail is going to walk us through a task that exemplifies that particular standard. Go ahead, Gail. Okay, so I'm going to give you you guys just a problem that seems pretty simple. So I'm going to the next slide, Pam. Um, I'm going to ask you to solve. Oh, oh go to the yep. TNS. That's okay. Go to the TNS file. So I'm going to ask you to solve a system of equations. And I, for real, solve the system of equations. So whip out your pencils and tell me what the solution to that system is. When you get your answer, type it in the chat. And while you're typing, while you're working, somebody asked if the, the square root cube root would be an algebra one activity. I think you could do it um, in the, the eighth grade. Whenever kids start learning about square roots and cube roots, as well as an algebra one. And sometimes you might even have to revisit it a little bit later. Okay, I'm getting some answers here. And the answers I'm getting look are all the same. They're negative one, two. Awesome. Okay, Pam, next, next page. All right, solve this one. Now, I can't hear you, but when I say this to my class, they go, you got to be kidding. They moan and they groan. They don't like these kinds because the coefficients aren't nice. So let's just take advantage of technology. So let's go to the next page. Let's insert a page, Pam. Let's go there. All right, so Pam's going to go to the menu. And we're going to use technology to solve this. She's going to go to algebra. She's going to go to um, solve systems of equations. And she's going to go to solve systems of linear equations. We've got two equations and two variables, so the default is good, so say OK. And now we're just going to type in those two equations that we were going to solve. Um, oh, and I forgot what they were. Um, <laughs> so did I. <laughs> Was it 4x plus 7x? I don't remember. Um, let's go back a page. We'll know. There we we'll go, 7. 7x, OK. 7x plus 8y equals 9, 10x plus 11y equals 12, and enter. Ah. Now, some of you maybe figured that out already, or some of you had already solved it. Um, and so we get negative 1, 2 again. Way cool. So Pam, go back to page 1.2. What do you notice? What conjecture might you want, you guys want to make? Anybody want to make a conjecture? Just to repeat to everybody in case you missed it, both of the systems had the same solution. Right. And that solution was negative one, two. So when things like that happen in mathematics, it's like, hey, what should I notice? What's going on here? Anybody notice anything? I think they notice the chat. Maybe throw that in the chat. All the constants and constraints were upped by six. Ooh, somebody, Michael, says the numbers were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That's increased by three. You guys are noticing a lot of good things. So here's a question for you. What if I gave you the equation 13x plus 14y equals 15? 16x plus 17y equals 18. What do you think the solution would be? So I'm going to say 13x plus 14y equals 15. 16x plus 17y equals 18. And Chrissy's guessing that it's negative 1, 2. And I'm going to tell her that she's probably right. Because it's pretty cool, but when the the integer, the coefficients are consecutive integers, the solutions are going to turn out to be negative 1, 2. That's kind of awesome. Let's just move on a little bit farther here. So let's go 
to past page 1.3, let's go to um, graph each. What do you notice? What do you wonder? Now, we don't really have time for you guys to graph all these things. So we're so I'm giving you um, six equations and I want the graphs. So we've graphed them for you. So go to the next page, Pam. So there they are. Oh, are we... hey, Gail. Yes. Gail, I, I think I, there must be a typo. Why? Well, we already made one typo, Pam. Do you think we made another one? But I mean, Gail, one of those lines does not look like the others. Oh, yeah. You guys, do you think that was a mistake? That orange line looks different. What do you notice about all the lines except the orange line? What do you guys notice out there? Type it in the chat room. What's true of the graphs? What am I noticing? Same point of origin. What do you mean by same point of origin? Same uh, intersection. And Kim says the intersection is a negative one too, except for the gold one. I can't believe we had two typos, Gail. That's terrible. Well, let's look back at those equations. Can you guys spot which one is the gold one? Oh, somebody says the orange line is the last equation. Jennifer agrees. Hey guys, why is the orange line the last equation? What is common about the first equation? So they all have the same solution except the orange, or they all have the same, well, they all intersect at the same point. What's different about that last equation? Anybody notice what's different? So I, hmm. Others have a common difference between the digits. Oh, yeah. Doesn't. So now if this were my class, I'd really ask Patrick to explain what he means. It's probably going to be hard for him. He says the last equation because the others have a common difference between the digits. The last one doesn't. So I would really want Patrick to stand up there and explain with, with each equation what he's talking about. And his, it might look something like um, the first equation goes one, two, three. So it's a common difference of one. The second equation goes five, three, one. So it's a common difference of down two. The third equation goes one half, one, one and a half. The next one is one, down three, down three. You guys are seeing it, right? The next one is 100, up one, up one. And the last one is 100, down 101. And if it's going to have a common difference, it should be down another 101. Well, I think you're actually down 201. 201. From, from 100 to 101. Down, down 201, so I'd have to go down 201, so I'm not going to end up at 202. I don't got to end up at so this is a pretty awesome thing. Does anybody know what those numbers are when they have a common difference like this? Probably something that was way back in your head somewhere. Um, the Algebra 2 teachers might recognize it. These numbers are all in an arithmetic progression. Like so an arithmetic sequence. They have a common difference, and that makes an arithmetic sequence. So it's pretty impressive that if the coefficients, you can go to the next page, Pam. If the coefficients, um, oh, there they all are all written out. If the coefficients are in an arithmetic progression, the equation will pass through the point negative one, two. And I'd ask you to spend some time playing with this uh, but one of the things I ask my students is, well, how could you actually really prove that? So you can plug in negative one, two, and see that it gives you an identity, a plus two. Um, you can also go to the next page, 2.6. I think it's, Pam, can you go to the, yeah, it's 3.1, I think. Yeah. You can also graph it. And if Pam clicks, so we've graphed. The coefficients are in an arithmetic progression, A, 
A plus C, A plus 2C. That's how you, starting from the initial value of A with a constant difference. If Pam clicks on the sliders, you'll see that no matter what happens, that when the A changes, it stays at the negative 1, 2. And if she changes the C, the constant difference, it stays at negative 1, 2. That's yeah. crazy. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Okay. So what do you guys think about this task in terms of promoting reasoning and problem solving? <laughs> Patrick said, this is wild. <laughs> and Pamela says, a good thing is to keep asking probing questions. So she's actually going to one of the other um, principles for effective teaching in the asking probing questions. Um, so I think it's, it's part of how these all things work and connect together. Um, so notice we were using multiple representations. We were making the connections um, between the graphs and the, um, and the patterns in the numbers. Um, so there's a lot of mathematical understanding and, and thinking that's going on in, in a task like this. And just to, just to make it even more interesting, if you have some kid who's an eager, eager beaver, you might say, well, you know, I wonder what would happen if we took um, the Fibonacci series and made the coefficients of a system of equations or an equation, the Fibonacci series. What would happen? Or if we tried the arithmetic progression on a quadratic, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. I wonder what would happen. Um, so kind of getting kids to move out of some of the step-by-step -step ways of thinking about stuff and going off in a little different direction. Um, cool problem. Let's we'll turn it back to Pam for another way of thinking about stuff. Excellent. I'm, I'm just going to mention one quick thing before we move on. Uh, Mike said it's cool, but wonders where it fits. We wonder if this could fit um, in a, uh, your solving systems um, to, uh, in a way to sort of pull back on what you might have done before with students with arithmetic progressions. So it would be a way to sort of pull together graphs and equations and pull back a little bit on some learning that, that uh, usually uh, students are doing in Algebra 1 with uh, arithmetic sequences. So we thought that could be a way to kind of pull a lot of things together. So the next task that we're going to do is um, a favorite of mine. Um, you know, there's that, that standard that we all have to make sure students can pass, um, a student standard in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 that is helping them find a good viewing window. Okay, I'm being, I'm being facetious at this moment. There is no standard that says find a good viewing window. You don't even know what I'm talking about. So let me give you an example. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm the low-tech person tonight, and Gail's the high-tech. Uh, if you believe I can only do low tech, then we can chat. But we wanted to make sure that we did some examples on uh, both uh, the TI-84s. Um, so I'm using the TI-84 emulator. And it just so happened the two I chose were 84s and the two Kale chose were Inspires. Um, but the task that I give students is I'll give them um, a, a function. And I'll say, predict where you think this particular function would be if you had to go find a good viewing window. In fact, I just wanted to start with this one. So the very first thing I do, and I'm, I'm going to kind of just uh, talk through a few things, and then I'll actually ask you guys some questions. So the first thing I'll do with students is say, just go graph x squared. And usually they'll just put it in, and they'll hit a graph, and they'll go, there it is. And I'll say, do you think that's a very good window? And students will go two ways with this. One way is, um, and I'll ask some questions to sort of get them there, but one way is they'll say it's not square. And um, I'm just in a Zoom 6 window, a uh, brief story about the history of TI. The reason that Zoom 6, Zoom standard, the reason that it exists is because all of the graphs in the teacher's typical textbooks could be graphed in a negative 10, 10, negative 10, 10 window. And so TI engineers said, obviously, this must be important to math teachers. So they created a Zoom standard so that all, all, uh, all of the problems in the textbook could sort of show up in those windows. Um, that's kind of a silly reason. Uh, because it's not a square window, because we're trying to shove negative 10, 10, negative 10, 10 into a rectangular viewing space. And so, therefore, when you look at this graph, it's actually skewed. It's not what x squared actually looks like. So, um, over time, TI put in this zoom square. So, if you look at zoom uh, 5, that's zoom square. Now, we're looking at a square window. That's actually what y equals x squared looks like. Now, whenever I go over one unit, I go up the same, um, the, the, the over and the up, but the, it's a square window. Uh, so, that's actually what y equals x squared looks like. So that could be one definition of 
a good viewing window. But the other definition is there's a lot of extra space in this uh, window right now. So if we were to actually sort of get rid of some of that extra space, how would you set the window? The rules of this game is that you cannot use the zoom keys. So um, I ask students to set windows just in the window screen. And so students will start messing around with kind of trying to get in on that graph and get rid of some of the extra space. A thing that they'll start to do is they'll say, well, get rid of some of that negative, uh, all, that, all that space below. We don't need any of that. Well, then I'll, I'll make them talk to me about which number they're going to change and why. So they sort of have to reason through the fact that they're going to maybe change that to not be quite so negative. Ah, now we've gotten rid of some of that extra space that we had below. I'll leave it a little negative because one of my favorite jokes, math teachers are often a little negative. Ha ha. Uh, but I like to see the origin. So this will uh, let us see the x-axis. And then we might want to get rid of some of the extra space on either side of that uh, quadratic. And so I'll have kids mess around until they get something like maybe uh, more like negative 4. Oh, I want to do that a little faster. Maybe more like negative 4 and then up to 4. And we might have a window that um, has a little bit of less extra space. OK, now you guys get to be involved. If you have graphing technology um, handy, I'm going to actually ask you this time to find a good viewing window, but not for y equals x squared. I want to replace where we had x. Now I want you to replace x with x minus 250, um, and then we'll still square that. So it's, it is something squared, but now it's x minus 250. And what I'd like you to do is find a good viewing window for that. We're running a little short on time, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. Um, in fact, I'm really kind of not. Let me just tell you what happens. Uh, kids will hit the graph screen and they'll say, well, there's the original one that we had. Um, miss, my, my calculator is broken. I don't, I don't understand. Where's the other one? And then I'll ask students to consider, well, what do you know? I usually use this after students have had an introduction to transformations. I'll say, well, what do you know about transformations? Where should that be? And they'll, they'll say, oh, that guy should be uh, like 250. And students will often go to the left and to the right. Um, and we'll let them do that. We'll let them look. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stay at negative 4. And then we're going to go over and go to something like um, 260. And we should be able to now see way over there in the corner, there's that little tiny skinny red parabola. And so we can see the original y equals x squared, and we can also see this um, replacing x with x minus 250. And we, we definitely have students that look to the left, and then we get to discuss how sort of the world has shifted. Um, and so as we kind of move the graph paper underneath, we kind of have that, x, that replacing x with x minus 250 showing up to the right. Um, and then I might ask students, hey, uh, uh, did anybody come up with a window where we're just looking at the red function, the, the replacing with x minus 250? And sure enough, somebody has gone in there and somebody said, well, I think if I just look a little bit to, no, nah, I didn't want negative 240. I just wanted 240. If we just look between 240 and 260, ah, check it out. Now we're, we're sort of scooted way over there. And now it's not this little blip of a parabola, but it looks more like a parabola. And somebody might get in there a little bit more and get rid of some of that extra space. And then I might say, well, cool. Could you use what you know about transformations to graph? Find me a good viewing window. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Find me a good viewing window for um, the whole function, the normal x squared. But this time, I'm going to take that whole function and I'm going to drop it 750. Now, maybe I won't quite use those words because that might be a little leading. But then I'll ask them, where is that guy uh, going to be? And then some students might go back to Zoom 6, or they might stay in this window where we were clear over there. Um, I kind of like to go from the one that was at uh, like um, the negative 4 that we had before where we could see both of them. <clears throat> and I might uh, find, oh, well, look at that. There's that, um, the, our, our third function is a, a black color. Um, we could change that color so it doesn't, sometimes that gets a little confusing. Uh, looks a little bit like the, oops, looks a little bit like the axis. And so instead of, um, come on, Pam, you can do it. No, I want to change it from, there we go. I don't want, do I want pink? Pink is good. So then I might have pink so that when we are in the graph, um, I can see, ah, hey, I can see a little bit of it. Where's the rest of it? Well, can you use your knowledge of transformations to open up the window so that we can see that guy? And again, I would let students take some time. Uh, low cost of, of error here. They can make all sorts of errors, and they can still keep looking around until they find a good view, uh, viewing window. If we had a little bit more time, but we're running a little short, I would have asked you guys to tell me, if, are you going to open up the X's? Are you going to open up the Y's? And somebody would have opened up the Y's to maybe something like that, 751 down there. And hey, there she goes. So we can see, if you look at the top, you can see a little bit of blue original. 
and a little bitty red uh, away over off to the side, and then you've got the minus 750 down below. This is still not a great viewing window because we're totally cutting off part of that. But again, I would let students kind of mess around with that. And then as they mess, low cost of error, they're feeling transformations. They're really getting a sense and a feel that when we tell them this is what transformations do to functions, it actually does. I'll leave you with a couple fun ones for you to play with on your own time. Um, if I were just to look at uh, sine of x, sine of x isn't too bad. I'm actually going to go back here and turn these off. So I've just I've gone over the equal sign and just hit enter so that they're not graphing anymore. I'm going to hit zoom 7 because that's a trig window. So that's sine of x. We all know what that looks like. Um, for your viewing pleasure, when you get a minute, instead of looking just for sine of x, look for 500 sine of x. Whoops, Pam, come on, you can do it. Five small. I'm not nervous. I'm not nervous. Sine of x. And uh, I'll, just, I'll go ahead and turn off the original sign so we don't get that confused. Now we're looking for green. What do you think 500 sine of x will look like in a typical trig viewing window? Well, wait a minute. Sine is a bunch of vertical lines. How in the So I'll let you play with how you could find a good viewing window to actually make that look like. Um, what sign should look like, and then maybe also play with, let me actually turn that one off, uh, also play with sign, I did it again, anybody want to know what I'm doing, I'm ac accidentally typing, um, I'm, I'm trying to type instead of hit the keys, because I'm really not that dumb, but tonight I'm flustered, uh, try to type sign of 50x, and what would a good viewing window for 50x, so just in that normal trig window, I'll just show you, well that looks pretty normal, uh, Pam, what's your deal? That looks pretty normal. So we're just in between negative 8 and 8. I'm just going to go ahead and change this to negative 4 something to 4 something. So we've just we've just shrunk our window on the x's just a little bit. That looks that looked normal, like a sign. What in the world is that? <laughs> so there's some there's some stuff going on with technology and pixels. Um, and so then you could play around a little bit with y equals uh, 50x to find a good viewing window. Um, there's actually a lot of uh, periods happening in this um, rather small window, uh, and it's kind of fun to play around with. So if that was the task that we ask students to do, what teacher um, principles to action standard might we, might we have been trying to get at? Well, it might not feel like it because I, I sort of told you this whole thing, and I didn't really get a chance to ask you uh, very many questions. Therefore, I didn't facilitate a very meaningful mathematical discourse, but hopefully you could get a feel how we could get students to talk about finding these viewing windows, why the functions look the way they look in the different viewing windows, um, justify their windows, especially those trig ones get really fun, um, and that uh, we could hopefully facilitate a meaningful discourse around that, that mathematics. I felt like I totally just ruined that by talking too much. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I think it's actually a really good activity because um, it gets kids to um, to try to develop a number sense about what the transformations are in in a way that I mean they can always just keep like you said low cost they can always keep going back and trying something else and it, it enables them to start reasoning about the things that are important um, rather than just punching a button I mean I still have my calculus kids are still trying to figure out when you go x minus a does that minus a move it to the right or to the left. And so they need experiences like this. Great. Okay, Gail, I think I'm going to turn it back to you for our last task. Okay. So we're going to go look at um, kind of a different one. Um, we're going to look at something from building concepts, um, expressions and equations, about using structure to solve equations. And this is an ex I, I didn't think about this until um, I actually ran into the Dutch. Um, and, and worked with some of them, and, and they thought about this. And I actually remember doing this a little bit um, with about using structure. So this comes from Building Concepts. It's free on the TI website. You can just look it up in expressions and equations, but we're going to just look at how we might think about structure to solve equations from one perspective. So let's go to 1.3, Pam. Okay, and so basically what I'm going to do is cover up. So Pam's going to click on expressions, and she's going to cover up, in a sense, the x plus 6, and I'm going to think to myself, what times 2 makes 50? And I would expect you guys to chime in with that answer. 
Um, and it's probably 25. So Pam submitted it, and we type in 25. Oh, and it says yes. And now I can think to myself, what do I add to 6 to get 25? Um, she's going to submit. And I'm going to say, hmm, I think it's 19. And she's going to enter 19, and it says yes. So just by reasoning, I solved that problem. Now, there's other ways you could solve this problem. You could start off by thinking about structure, by um, dividing both sides by two. Um, that's a great way to do it. Okay, so you want to encourage that as well. But let's try another one. Let's go to new and this, this file randomly generates things. So um, okay, so here we go. Let's uh, let's not use it. Let's do another one. Let's keep randomly generating till I get one that I want to talk about. Oh, that's a great one. Um, so she's going to hit expression, and I'm going to cover stuff up until I get to an arithmetic problem. I understand. Oh, I understand this one. What do I add to 6 to get 61? I'm going to guess that the answer is 55. That's right. Now I'm going to cover up x plus 4, and I'm going to say, what do I times 5 by to get 55? And I'm going to guess that the answer is 11. And I'm right. Uh, so I'm all excited. And now I'm going to guess what do I or add to 4 to get 11. My answer would be 7. And so by just reasoning about missing factors and missing add-ins, I can solve an equation in a really easy way. Let's try another one. Let's see if we can get a good fraction one here um, quickly. Um, not, no, we don't want to do that one. Try another one. These are all randomly generated. Oh, that's a good one. All right, so cover up. Um, let's just, just choose some things. Um, okay, so what do I divide by 4 to get 14? I think it might be 56. I it was right. If I was wrong, I could undo and it would fix it up. Now I'm going to cover up x plus 3, and I'm going to say, what do I times x plus 3 by to get 56? Uh, 7 by to get 56, and the answer would be 8. And now I can just tell you the answer is 5. Hey, should we, should we do it? Uh, let's guess wrong a little bit here so they can see. Oh, um, I'm going to tell you the answer is 4. And it says no. All that is. So you can undo. Oh, I should have undoed. I undid. I just hit reset. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the same, in uh, just because we're getting a little bit short on time, um, we could have done that other one by using the fraction. Click through it just to quick see. We won't finish it, but try some new ones. Um, keep going. Keep going. I'm looking for another one. Keep going. Keep going. Yep. There, there's one. Oh. Here we could. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, basically, you could, have, you could have covered up the whole top and looked at the bottom, or you could cover up here. You could cover up the 6 plus 8 and look for what divided by 12, uh, by 5 makes 12, or you could go hit another one and you could say 6 times what makes 12, and you could select and it would be 2. And so then you have a, a different problem. So it's really kind of a nice way to get kids to think about stuff. And I have actually found it an awesome way to solve problems using my brain um, instead of um, saying, well, first I have to, you know, clear all the fractions, and then I have to combine all the like terms, and then I have. And it just has become a very powerful way of thinking to me. Um, and, okay, so let's just kind of wrap this up here, Pam. Hey, Gail, let me just add for this particular thing. I find that when I solve equations um, sort of in this vein, uh, that my brain is thinking and reasoning more than than just procedurally doing stuff, and I, I like that. Um, so we would submit that um, this would be a way to build procedural fluency from conceptual understanding. Um, a lot of you guys are piping in the chat that you think this would be pretty cool. Um, uh, we think so too. I think it's pretty nice. So to wrap this all together, um, uh, we want to just ask the question, how do we make this happen? How do we encourage these eight practices with teachers? And one uh, thing that we wanted to bring up is that um, we've just been talking about teaching practices, 
but there's also the student practices. So the first um, black bullets up here, the learning practices, are the mathematical practices for students. Uh, most of us are familiar with the eight habits of um, the eight mathematical practices in the Common Core that are all about the habits of mind that students should be employing as they're doing mathematics. We today we've been talking about the teaching practices. Well, how do those all fit together? Here here are the student standards for mathematical practices. These are the eight that we would hope students would be doing. You might recognize some of, of these kind of implicitly in the eight standards that we just talked about tonight for teachers. That if students are making sense of problems and persevering and solving them, we probably use those eight teaching standards to help make these things happen, to help students reason abstractly and quantitatively, to help them construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others, to help them model with mathematics and use appropriate tools strategically, to help students attend to precision, look for and make use of structure and regularity in repeated reasoning. So, um, and I, Pam, I, I'm going to interrupt that. I sure. think it, they could map what the four activities we did directly onto these standards for mathematical practice. If the kids were engaged in the activities we gave them, they would be doing um, these mathematical practices. Yeah, and that's one of our goals, or maybe our big goal. So the last thing I want to do is just kind of put these three sets of standards together. So we have the teaching standards on the left that we've been talking about tonight. We have the student math practice standards that we just talked about. We also have content standards, right? We also have, say, I'm an Algebra 1 teacher. I supposed to teach the Algebra 1 standards. Um, I think, uh, and I wish, I, in fact, if anybody that is listening to the webinar um, knows who I'm quoting, but I heard in the last six months somebody say this, and darn it, I can't remember who said it, so I'm not taking credit for it, but I love this idea. I think sometimes we think, all right, I'm going to use these teaching standards to teach Algebra 1 content. That's my goal. That's my main objective. And um, to do that, I'll, I'll sort of use these, math, these student math practice standards to get at my main content objective. Well, the suggestion that was made that I really, really like and would love to give the appropriate person credit was instead consider that actually what we're trying to achieve is students who do these things, that these student mathematics practice standards are the goal. We want to create these students. We want this to be happening in our classes. How do we do that? Ah, through the teaching standards and through the content. So how do I create students that do those things? I'm going to use Algebra 1 content to do that. How, how, how might you get students to do those eight mathematical practices? Ah, you might use Algebra 2 content or Pre-Cal content or, or Calculus code. Whatever it is, whatever the content that you teach, you're going to sort of use that as a vehicle to create students who are mathematizing, students that are actually doing mathematics. Okay, great. Okay. So yep. We have to quit because the light needs is three minutes. So connect with Gail. There's her Twitter handle. Here's my Twitter handle. It's kind of tiny at the bottom. This is also my website, mathiscreatable.com. Uh, that's a great place to connect with me, and you can also receive weekly emails. In 20 seconds or less, uh, on Wednesday evenings, I do a thing called Math Strat Chat on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, where I throw out a question, and people from around the world throw out their strategies uh, where everybody's really thinking and reasoning. And back to you, Mike. Oh, those are resources that will be in the thing. <laughs> Thanks so much, Pam and Gail, for everything you shared tonight. Pam, I'm going to grab control back. So we're really excited that the T-Cubed International Conference is coming to Dallas uh, this coming March. I think Pam had mentioned at the very beginning of the webinar um, that tonight uh, one lucky winner is going to be receiving a free conference registration. Uh, and that lucky winner tonight is Susan Abram or Abraham. So Susan, congratulations. We'll be in touch over email in the next uh, couple of days to give you a little more information. Uh, but we really hope to see Susan as well as everyone else at the T-Cubed International Conference. Feel free to visit our website to learn a little more. Uh, there's currently some special pricing going on for that conference as well. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click the link in the chat window. Uh, also, there's a link for the documents that were used tonight, uh, mainly the PowerPoint by Gail and Pam. Um, if these links aren't working for any reason for you, just hang tight. You'll automatically get a follow-up email, uh, and that follow-up email will be uh, links to the certificate, the documents, and the recording as well. That way you can go back through this at your own pace. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. And last but not least, um, if you're following the, the latest promotion that we're doing, the TI Extra Credit promotion, 
Uh, you can gain extra points um, and receive things from TI. Uh, tonight's code, uh, which is not case sensitive, uh, is rich tasks. So I'm going to put that in the chat window as well. Uh, you can visit our website to learn a little more about uh, that promotion, the TI Extra Credit promotion. Uh, but again, the code for tonight for the webinar is rich tasks, all one word, not case sensitive. Um, thanks so much to Gail and Pam for everything you shared tonight. Uh, it feels like this hour kind of flew by. Um, thanks so much to everyone for joining us, and we hope to see you back online real soon. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody.